don't believe that balance exists. I believe it's wholeness. I'm whole to begin with, but I I have work to do. Wholeness to me is being able to be your own bridge to your heart, through your heart. You know, it feels like I've arrived at that moment when I know why I'm here and I know how I'm going to serve. You know, I've been in a broad perspective of helping people feel better. You know, that's been something I've the, that I've been trained in and I've been working toward. But I feel like I've narrowed my focus to one specific topic, and that is authenticity. I don't know if we can really experience deep joy or ultimate peace if we are not living from an authentic place. In a world that often feels like it demands conformity, the journey to authenticity becomes a powerful and transformative experience. Authenticity is not merely a buzzword, because I'm hearing it all the time. You know how you kind of notice once you decide something, it kind of shows up a lot. But it's a profound commitment. It's not just a buzzword. It's a profound commitment to being true to oneself. So in this episode, we're going to delve into the essence of authenticity. We're going to explore the challenges we face as we embrace it and provide insights into the liberating journey of living authentically. So we have to start with defining authenticity or looking at what that that is. And authenticity is the courageous act of expressing one's true self, irrespective of societal expectations or pressures. So this is the true you without all the the influence, I would say. It involves aligning actions with our personal values, embracing our imperfections, and living in a way that resonates with the core of who you are. And it's amazing how easy it is for us to not do that. And we don't even know it. We don't even know it because we're so ingrained to show up as we're supposed to. We don't really know what we really are. One thing I do want to address right away is the idea that some believe If we give people the freedom to be authentic to themselves, then they will choose counter to the expectations and pressures. But that's not authenticity either. You know, and that's the whole journey. Because if we've been influenced by society or by by our family, whatever that is, if we've been influenced by that, and then we realize that's not really who I am, so I'm going to do the opposite, then we're still being influenced. We're still under the influence rather than this true authentic self. And the the fact of the matter is, is, you know, I don't know if we'll get to, to the completely the truth of the authentic self. I don't know if we can totally dissolve the ways that we've been raised, the thoughts that we've taken on, the beliefs that we've created because of our experiences. We can't start from scratch. But what we can do is find that sweet spot where the sensations within my body feel like a deep breath. And we know this is me. This is who I am. This feels right to me. And I think when we act from that space, when we choose, when we love from that space, when we work from that space, then everything that the work, the love, the choosing is so rich. It's just so creative and beautiful and authentic. An amazing book that explores authenticity is The Gifts of Imperfection by Brene Brown, who doesn't know that book. If you have not read that book, you need to go listen or buy that book immediately. Because in this book, Brene Brown delves into the concepts of authenticity, vulnerability, and wholehearted living. It's She wrote it, I think, before she had her first tech talk, TED Talk. So it's like the juice, the, the, the bits of, of who she is. Here's a passage I want to read from the book that captures the essence of authenticity. She says, Authenticity is the daily practice of letting go who we think we're supposed to be and embracing who we are. Choosing authenticity means cultivating the courage to be imperfect, 
to set boundaries and to allow ourselves to be vulnerable, exercising the compassion that comes from knowing that we are all made of strength and struggle and nurturing the connection and sense of belonging that can only happen when we believe that we are enough. This passage emphasizes the ongoing nature of authenticity, framing it as it's a daily practice that involves letting go of societal expectations and embracing one's imperfections. It speaks to the courage required to be the true to be true to oneself, the importance of setting boundaries and the recognition that vulnerability is an integral part of the authentic experience. I mean, to set a boundary that is vulnerable. Sometimes that's the most vulnerable thing that some of my clients do is they create a boundary. And just a side note for a little bit, you know, we think of boundaries as where you can't, we, we want, we want to block someone else from invading our space. And that can feel so mean sometimes, especially women, we, we, we don't want to do that. We think we're being mean. But I think what I found so often, a time and time again with my clients, is really what happens is, is when we don't have a boundary, we don't say, here's the boundary, and then somebody comes in our space. And most of the time, that's just, it does, it's not even physical, right? Sometimes it's not even physical. Sometimes it is. But it's just like, okay, yes, I'll make the extra batch of cookies for the bake sale because I don't want to have a boundary that says no. And then what happens is I'm up late, I don't get the up the sleep, I had all these other things going on, and I didn't have a boundary, which is I didn't allow my capacity, my real, true, authentic capacity to exist. So now I'm working, I'm living, I'm acting beyond my capacity, beyond my authenticity, and beyond my boundary. And guess what? We don't get away with that for free. It comes out somewhere. Either our kids fill it, our body fills it, something fills it. Our capacity is only what it is. And that's authentic. And we can grow our capacity. Maybe there's things I should have done so that I had enough time. You know, we make mistakes. Again, part of our wholeness that we talked about in the the hundredth episode. Wholeness is about accepting those things. Yeah, we make mistakes. We should have done it different. We should have done this. But authentically, I know my capacity and I will work to grow it at certain points, but I also have to know what it is. And if I can't bake those cookies and be at my best with the people that I am devoted to, if I start to make my kids pay for the fact that I didn't keep a boundary, then I'm not doing a service to myself. I'm not doing a service to my my kids. And then guess what? We build resentment. We don't even build it. It is just there. We can try and push down resentment, but when that resentment's there, it is not, it's kind of a reflex. It's not something we choose into. And so I have to know this authentic self of me to know my boundaries, to know my capacity. And then, you know what? We can practice what we need to practice is just the ability to communicate in a way that says, oh, my friends, I wish I could make those cookies. I want to say yes. It's difficult for me to say no, but I know myself and I cannot and I am so sorry and I wish I could. The end, you know, or it's those kind of things. It's coming up with the, because what happens is we always, we have resentment because they asked. We have resentment before we've even, we haven't given them a no. We resent them for even asking us, but that's not their responsibility. That's again, a problem with boundaries. We're bringing them into our space when they shouldn't be there. That should be our responsibility to know our capacity and be able to speak it in a way that is communicative and not not accusatory or, or mean or or that puts somebody else, that has the other person leave that conversation not feeling well. There's no need for it. We, we can have boundaries and everybody can feel like we're loved and accepted. Those two things are not opposite with each other. But again, that book, Gifts of Imperfection, Brene Brown's work has resonated with so many people. She offers insights into this authenticity over and over again with her idea of vulnerability. You cannot have authenticity without vulnerability. And when you are vulnerable, you are 
the most authentic. Those are some of our most authentic times. And and that's, she calls it wholehearted living. I call it wholeness. Many of us wear masks, metaphorical shields, right, that we construct to navigate through different aspects of life. We do this. This is just, this is what we are, feel like we're supposed to do. These masks provide a sense of security and they distance us from that authentic self, right? Unveiling the inauthentic self requires self-awareness, introspection, and a willingness to explore the depths of our true identity. You know, I can think of, in my own life, do I put on makeup as a sort of mask? You know, when I look in the mirror, I suck in, I look, you know, I give you the duck face, I look at my best in the mirror. And I'm using makeup and I'm using other things to try and present myself in a way that that is acceptable. And and it's not bad. It's not that the true me is unacceptable, maybe. But I have to ask myself every once in a while if if I have feelings about showing up as my true self, if I do have that little extra weight, is that okay? If I do have an extra wrinkle on the, you know, corner of my eye, can I allow that to be real? Is that okay? Is that enough? You know, recently I was looking in the mirror and I thought, you know, I'm going to be 50 next year. And I the thought occurred to me, I wonder if, you know, it was just this subtle little voice in the back of my head that said, it might be okay if I looked 50 years old. <laughs> because I am 50. Like it was just this realization of the idea that that I was so ingrained into my system was this idea that I was not supposed to look my age. And yet that's just craziness. That is just craziness. That's just saying the sky is, we're just going to will the sky to be purple. And there's parts of it, there's times where there's a purple glint, but it is not purple. It's authentically blue. And and if I show up with my authenticity, if I show up feeling comfortable with who I am, then other people show up and mirror that to me. It's just it's just the way it is. Or if they don't, I don't give it a second thought. I don't question because I know my authentic self and I trust it and I allow it and I accept it. And those feelings I have of discomfort are feelings rather than the truth, which is a big difference. They are a feeling, a sensation in my body, maybe a false belief or even just a belief. Even if it's even if it's true, it's just a belief. It doesn't have to influence me. It doesn't have to take over who I am. So how do we know if we are authentic? How do we know? We must feel it. We must feel it physically. It's this unspeakable, it's different for each person, this inner knowing. It cannot be taught, it cannot be told, but you know it when you're there. And it comes from being vulnerable and accepting the difficulties in our lives. And the truth of the matter is, is a lot of times trauma is the mask. And we must be willing to walk down that path, knowing that if I'm going to work with a a helper, a coach, a healer, that they're going to walk me slowly and they're going to be there by me but I'm going to go look in that shadowy part of my background and I'm going to at least know what really was because the feelings the the terror that it, that we think we're going to find there is already living within us let's just be authentic with it and know what it really really is and then we can make some changes and then we have the ability to be different where we don't when we're not facing the realities of things. Too often, we are not familiar <laughs> with these authentic sensations because too often we let authenticity go to stay attached to our loved ones and caretakers. From the time we were young, we as human beings need attachment or, in other words, connection. So in psychology, it's called attachment, and I know in in 
Eastern philosophies, attachment, attachment is not the goal, but in relationship, we want to feel attached that no matter how far we go as a young child, we might go far away, but we're still attached. We're still connected. We're still loved and admired by those those caretakers, that they're going to watch out for us. That's just a need that we humans have. Ha- have. And Dr. Gabor Monte, he's a H- Hungarian-Canadian physician and author, and he has written extensively on the topics related to mental health, addiction, stress, and the mind-body connection. If you don't know him, like if you do know him, help me get him on my podcast. He's amazing. He believes that many mental health issues can arise from a disconnection from one's true self, often stemming from early childhood experiences and societal pressures. So it just, when he st- when he talks, it just, you feel it at your core. There's so many videos on YouTube that where he just truth bombs the reality. He's able to explain things in a way that you just say, oh my gosh, yes, that's, why do we do that? So he describes authenticity as understanding one's emotions, needs, and values, and expressing them honestly. He suggests that individuals who suppress their authentic selves may be more susceptible to stress, emotional pain, and mental health challenges. Another big one in the world of authenticity is Dr. Richard Swartz. His Internal Family Systems, or IFS, revolves around what he calls the big S self, that authentic part of us that gets lost when life's disruptions are overwhelming. The big S self is the core aspect of all of us that embodies positive qualities and serves as a source of wisdom, compassion, and guidance. He says that these are innate in us. We don't grow it. We are born with this big S self, this authentic part of ourselves. And when we go through difficult times, we might hide or we might um, cover up these uh, this authentic part. And when we discover it, when we can tune in to our own big S self or tune into this authenticity, this authentic part of who we are, he says it's almost like this entity that lives within us. If we can connect to that in any way, everything shifts. We, that's what the healing is. And, and that's a lot of what the library is about, is getting us to that place. It just is, like I said before, that authentic place is this feeling that cannot be taught or told. You feel it. And when you feel this authentic place or this big S self within you, when you connect to it, it just feels like you can take on things that are difficult or it just feels like your day is going to be okay or you just feel joyous sometimes, depending on where you're starting from. Carl Jung is quoted with the privilege of a lifetime is to become who you truly are. And I think that's something we are trying not to do. We're trying to become what is acceptable or what is enough. But who you truly are is the privilege of your life. We need you as an individual. Our our world needs the individual of you, or I don't think you would have been born. You matter. You are important. You are integral to us as a society. While the pursuit of authenticity is liberating in some ways, it's not without its challenges. We have to be honest about that. There's a delicate balance between being authentic and adapting to various social contexts. Striking this balance demands self-awareness, empathy, and the wisdom to discern when to express the unfiltered self and when to navigate social nuances without compromising personal values. There are times when, you know, it wouldn't be appropriate for us to be completely authentic or to not follow the social norms. That's, that is true. You know, that's just the way it is. If, if I don't like wearing shoes and the shop says shoes and shirts must be worn, you know, I can't, it it wouldn't be quite appropriate to just say, this is my authentic self, deal with it. You know, we do have to be part of society. And that is something that's important. Again, that's when we move into this communication side of things. How do I learn to express myself authentically and honor and respect the authentic parts of society, which (laughs) authentically society cannot cater to every 
individual person. It just doesn't work. So, so there's a balance there. One may feel, like I said before, that their authenticity was taken from them. And then they may move into living in the opposition, the opposite to what they have been living. And again, this is not authenticity, although it might feel liberating. This is part of a liberation for a time. But once that energy has been spent, that energy that maybe has been pent up for so long, then we feel lost once again. So we have to be really careful to just not swing the pendulum to the other end of the spectrum, to really take it slow. And and that's why wholeness is such an important part of that, because we embrace all of who we are. We don't just start cutting pieces off or aspects off. We we keep them and, and hold them. So there's a compelling movie that explores the theme of authenticity, and that is The Truman Show. It was made in 1998. It was directed by Peter Weir, and it starred Jim Carrey. And in this thought-provoking film, Truman, played by Jim Carrey, is unknowingly the star of a reality TV show that captures every aspect of his life from birth. And Truman lives in this carefully constructed world, and he's completely unaware that everyone around him is an actor, and his entire existence is staged and performed for the entertainment of this audience that's watching him. And the movie delves into Truman's journey of self-discovery as he begins to question the authenticity of his surroundings and the authenticity of his relationships. Truman's realization that his life has been carefully orchestrated prompts him to break free from the confines of the constructed reality, and he seeks authenticity beyond that scripted existence. It's it's a poignant choice. And if you're really paying attention to the, your body as you're watching that, you feel something. You feel something as you watch that movie. You feel a little bit of grief, not just for Truman in the show, but for yourself, for the ways that society really shapes us, how we wouldn't have these likes and dislikes had we not been born where we were or lived where we were and you feel it and i think that's why that movie is so powerful because it's not just about him we all are so molded by our experiences and by our surroundings and sometimes we need to pause and look at that and feel if that feels right within us or if there's something we need to add or something we need to subtract from our lives to to move into that authentic place. The Truman Show reflects on the courage required to unmask oneself and confront the artificiality of one's life and ultimately embracing authenticity, even if it means, I don't know, even if it means we're going to lose a whole lot, even in the face of a world that seeks to control or manipulate us or shame us into being something that we may not be or that we don't want to be or that we can't be. So if you contrast this movie, The the Truman Show, with watching Dead's Poet Society, what was made in 1989 and also directed by the same director as The Truman Show, Peter Weir, and it stars Robin Williams. I'm sure you've seen it. It's a classic This film is set in an all-boys elite preparatory school and follows English teacher John Keating, played by Robin Williams, as he encourages his students to embrace their individuality and pursue their passions. Heaven forbid. That's all he asks them to do, and it's such an uproar. The central message of the film revolves around the idea of authenticity in the face of societal expectations and conformity. John Keating inspires his students to think for themselves, to seize the day or carpe diem, right? And to pursue their true passions rather than succumb to the pressures of conformity imposed by their school and their families and the time period and the, the culture. I mean, that's what this movie is where I even learned the idea of carpe diem. You know, every time I hear that, I think of the Dead Poets Society. The movie just beautifully illustrates the transformative power of authenticity and the profound impact it can have on individuals who choose to break free from 
the societal norms that might not be true for them. They might be true for someone else, but everybody's an individual and they need to discover what that means for each person, what is true for themselves. It's a compelling exploration of the tension between conformity and individuality because it is, there is tension there. It is a powerful and inspiring portrayal of the importance of living authentically. We laugh and we cry and we feel full of hope as we watch this hero's journey unfold. It's heartbreaking. It's liberating within ourselves. If you watch that movie and again, feel the sensations in your body, what is it saying to you? What is it trying to to tell you about your own life? Maybe we identify with the ones wanting people to conform. And I get that. I get that. We don't want to be different. And when people around us start to embody their authenticity, sometimes that feels scary. They, they're changing. They're different. And there is a tension there. And as we acknowledge the tension and recognize it as tension and not something that's going to take us out, which is how it feels. Granted, I get that. It feels like it's going to take us out, but it won't. And a good coach, a good mentor is so valuable there because they are going to walk with you. They're going to help you not feel like it's going to take you out. Authenticity extends beyond individual growth. It profoundly influences the quality of our relationships speaking of what we were talking about. When we show up as our true selves, we attract those who resonate with our authenticity. Genuine connections built on trust and understanding flourish when authenticity becomes the foundation of our interactions. If we show up not as ourselves, what does that mean we're going to attract? Oprah Winfrey says, the best relationships are the ones that bring out the best in you. And I think she's right. I think she's right, but it's got to be the authentic you. Now I kind of want to just change gears and talk about some steps we can take toward living an authentic life. You know, how can we go there if we're starting to feel like I don't think I'm living my own life? What do we do then? Because it can, it can take us out. And if you watched any of those movies, you know what I mean. So number one, it's easy to said, harder done. We need some self-reflection. We need to spend time reflecting on our values, our beliefs, our passions. We have to know what really matters in our lives. And it's not something we can just do in our head because it just gets floaty up there. So when we really get it out, when we really have a a real blueprint of our values, our beliefs, our passions, what our goals are, where we want to be, where we are, it's just powerful. It just is the beginning of that journey. We just have to do it. And and it's something we just kind of think we know. But when we get it out on paper, when we or speak it out, if we need to record it into our phone, when we begin to really, really sit with our values, our beliefs, our passions, it's just the the birthplace of authenticity. That's that's the, the truth of what it is. And then we can change. Then we can be different. But we have to know what really is. So consider your strengths, your weaknesses, areas of personal growth. Acknowledge in this self-reflection both your accomplishments and where you can improve. Just just own that. Nobody, you don't have to show it to anybody. You don't have to get a, a grade from anybody about it. But we know. Just acknowledge those two parts, both our accomplishments and our weaknesses. The second thing we can do is to adopt mindfulness and presence practices. So a practice of mindfulness is to stay present in the moment. Mindfulness allows you to observe your thoughts and emotions without judgment. You know, I'm telling you, I went skydiving last week. Uh, This is in October. Um, I don't know when this is going to release, but in October, the beginning of October, I went skydiving and I made it like just really a present moment practice for me. And it was wild as I stepped onto the plane and I took a moment to be very present about I'm stepping onto this plane to jump out of it. And, and tomorrow I'm going to jump out of a plane. And, and as I'm sitting there and the plane is, 
you know, taking off. I'm taking off and I'm going to jump out of this plane. And I'm looking down at the ground that's so far away. And I think that's the ground and it's far, far away. And I'm going to jump out of this plane. And it was just wild. So I kept thinking, I, I was like, how come you know, I'm not scared? Like, I'm not afraid. And I, I stopped and felt into my own body to say, am I breathing okay? You know, I felt my breath and I was breathing down in my belly. And I felt my heart beat and it was beating rather slowly or or, or just gently. And I thought, I'm really not afraid. And I it was just the most amazing experience to be so present. There was just not room for fear because what was happening in this present moment wasn't scary. I might have, I was looking out of the plane in that moment. I wasn't in danger. Everything was fine in that moment. And when I stayed present, I wasn't looking to the future about what could happen. I just kept myself mindful of the present moment. And I was shocked at how I could jump out of an airplane and and not be afraid or I don't know. I didn't I didn't have the sense of fear. I just was presently with it. It was wild. And you have to pay attention to how you feel in different situations when you're mindful and when you're present and and see what's coming up for me right now. And maybe that coming up is telling me to do something different. But again, I get curious. I ask questions about my to myself about what I'm feeling. And emotions can be a valuable indicator of whether we are in alignment or misalignment with our authentic selves. The other thing we can do is we can explore our passions. We can engage in activities that genuinely bring us joy and fulfillment, whether it's a hobby or art or a sport. You know, these things can be good for our authentic selves. And sometimes, you know, we have these situations where it's just always been this way. Our family's always done it this way. And when we stop for a minute and explore the passion maybe that's not authentic for us maybe we're not a football fan it's just been something that the family did together it's really something to explore discovering our passions is sometimes so difficult I can't tell you how many times a client I'll ask a client what fills you up what brings you joy what what feeds your soul and how difficult it is for people to know that because we're supposed to show up for others. We're supposed to be there for others and our authentic self that is so buried that we don't even know how or what brings us joy and, and happiness. And there's a simple equation. There's not too many things that feel black and white to me or I'm willing to say are so simple, but this is so simple. If you want to feel more joy in your life, do things that bring you joy. Like, that's it. And we have to know what those are and that knowing is part of our authentic self. Discovering those things is the journey of the authentic self. We also need to look at our core values. You know, what are the things that are valuable to us? And thinking about jumping out of the airplane, the skydiving again, I didn't realize (laughs) until I put it on social media uh, how this skydiving is like the pinnacle of human bravery or it's like this huge deal. It is a huge deal. I think you go skydiving or you climb Mount Everest. Like those are like almost on equal footings and it just didn't feel that way for me. My values are different. My my fears are different. You know, I, I had so many people that said, oh, I could never have done that. And I wanted to say if I would have, you know, if I could have make it made it make sense on social media, I would have described this idea of you know, we have, my daughter has two birds. They're adorable. Like these birds are adorable. They have the cutest little personalities, but I can't stand when they fly around. You know, I can't stand it. And so I'm looking at these people and I think, I know you're putting me on this pedestal because I jumped out of an airplane, but I would rather do that than have the birds fly at me any day. (laughs) Like I have a trauma there. I have a trauma. We had this little parakeet when I was a kid, when I was younger And there would be times I'd be sitting downstairs watching TV back when the one TV set was down in the basement. And I'd be down there watching, not knowing that my dad had let the bird out of the cage. And after 
a half hour of sitting there, all of a sudden this bird flies at your face and it was so startling. It scared me so bad that to hear that flapping of the wings just terrifies me. (laughs) So I'm sitting there thinking, you know, that's what came to my mind as I was like, you might be afraid to jump out of an airplane, but I would do that any day over playing with these birds flying around. And you know, that's just knowing my values or, or, or my authenticity, you know, you got to know yours. There's, it's just, it's not about comparison. It's just different. There's fear is different inside different people and knowing my values, knowing who I am and not my values as far as it's more just like what is important to me. Core values are what are, what is valuable to me and valuable to me. It's less, I don't know, I don't have as much value about being scared of jumping out of an airplane as I do about scary birds. Like, you know, like the, the, I don't value um, the relationship with birds as much as I'm like, yeah, let's jump out of an airplane. That's fun. <laughs> I know that's strange. But when we understand our values, then our ability to choose our choices are easier to make. And those choices align with us and our authenticity because We know what we value and and then we act in a way that stays true to ourselves. We also need to embrace vulnerability. You know, it's just an easy thing to do. It is that muscle of vulnerability. When we are being vulnerable, it feels terrible inside. It is almost physical where it's like, just no, resist, stop, no. It's just because that muscle hasn't been built and hasn't been strengthened. But as we practice vulnerability, the first time you do it, it's going to feel like 100% wrong. But the second time you do it, it might be only 50%. And then it might be only 25%. And then what happens is, is those sensations, because we've built that muscle, because we're, we're familiar with those sensations of vulnerability, they just don't take us out as much. Maybe I need to practice that with the bird, <laughs> with the birds. Ollie and Paulo, I love you. They're funny. They're hilarious. I just don't want them to fly around me. So we talked about before finding authenticity is establishing boundaries because we need to protect our time. This is what boundaries are for. Time, energy, and well-being. And learning to say no when necessary is an important aspect of staying true to ourselves. And we need to recognize also at the same time when we need to step back from our boundaries. We can't be too boundaried. For instance, I I. I still have birds in my home because my authenticity is I don't like birds, but my daughter's authenticity is is she loves them. And so there needs to be a little bit of compromise there. Um, There needs to be, I can't just let the world revolve around my authenticity. That doesn't work. That's not authentic. That is protective. That is hypervigilant. That's different. You know, if I'm just trying to, if my authenticity is the rule, that's not authenticity. That's protection and safety. That's different. We also, beginning to discover our authenticity, we can look back at past experiences, both the positive and the negative, and see the lessons that we've learned, really get familiar. That's like our best observatory is our past to see what was the result of that. We have real data on the things that we've done in the past. So don't be afraid to look at those positive and negative aspects of our past and to learn from them, both good and bad, right? And use those challenges and setbacks as opportunities for growth and for that self-discovery. Another aspect of authenticity is to realize that it is always continuously growing. It is a journey. It's ongoing. It's how we evolve. We evolve. We don't just find our authenticity and be done. We need to try new things. Because in finding trying new things we get really clear on our authenticity. So we try a new food or we try a new activity and we say, yeah, that's authentic to me. Or nope, now we know we're just getting a little more chiseled in on who we really, really are and what that what is. So having more and new experiences is a good way to do that, a good way to continually grow. And finally, the best thing we can do to discover our authentic selves to live with authenticity is to seek out relationships and environments that encourage authenticity. Authenticity thrives in environments where people are free to express themselves 
without judgment. And I know for some people, they think, well, you can't just do whatever you want. But what's interesting is, is we have to get real with our authentic selves about what those feelings of judgment are about. Because if someone is living their life on their own, and it's not impacting us, literally impacting us, it shouldn't cause us distress. If it's causing us distress, that's a sign of something else. That's a sign of something other than that person going on. That's not theirs. And and we can do that in return. If I'm living my life and I'm not hurting someone else and they're insisting I am, you know, unless we have real impact on their lives, our authenticity doesn't need to, isn't hurting anybody. It is not hurting some people, but we might think that it is because we, because our boundaries are, are not put up. We mesh with other people. And so we think their choices affect who we are. If we surround ourselves with people that are authentic, it's so much easier to be authentic ourselves and to be brave and to be vulnerable with those people and connect with individuals that inspire you. Please surround yourself with authors and and people and mentors and coaches and speakers and wise people that inspire you. That's the best way to discover your authenticity. Because authenticity is a dynamic and ongoing journey. It's not a destination. It's about embracing the true self in all its facets, the light and the shadows. This is the very idea of wholeness. So in a world that often encourages conformity, authenticity becomes a radical act of self-love and resilience. Authenticity is a testament to the beauty that emerges when we courageously embrace who we truly are. Feel empowered every day with wholeness videos, meditations, downloads, classes, and more by joining the Wholeness Library at thewholenessnetwork.com.